for now, we're going to be talking a bit about Mod Reg. So I'm going to be passing the time over uh, to Dr. Zhang. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, sorry for not wearing proper shoes uh, because I injured my toe, and the doctor asked me not to wear you know, covered shoes for now. All right, so today we're going to be talking about the, for now, we're going to be talking about the module registration system, which is called ModRec, right? So this is going to be the system, let me see. Uh, doesn't work that well, okay, never mind. So this is going to be the system that uh, you're going to use every semester to select your modules. So first, I just want to quickly recap the common curriculum in CHS. I think by now you will know that we have three components right, in the common curriculum. Um, the first is the common core, six modules. The next is the integrated modules, five modules. And the last one are the interdisciplinary modules. right? So that's the 13 modules that everyone in CHS have to take. So why do I want to mention this uh, common uh, curriculum? Uh, in this common curriculum, there are two types of modules. For some modules, you can select the module you want right, by yourself. For example, for the interdisciplinary modules, for these two modules, there is a list of interdisciplinary modules that everyone can just choose two out of the, uh, from the list. right? So for this kind of modules, you're going to select the module that you want on ModRec. But for other modules in the common curriculum, such as, for example, the design thinking module. Right? There is only one module in the university that satisfies this requirement. So everyone has to take that module. So for this kind of modules, you actually will be pre-allocated the module in the ModRec system. Right? So that's the pre-allocation part. So what does it mean, pre-allocation? This means that you don't have to go on to ModRec to select that particular module by yourself, right? because that module will be given to you by the administrators. So which modules from the common curriculum will be pre-allocated? So here is the list, right? If you look at the list, remember there are five integrated modules, right? Out of the five integrated modules, four of them will be pre-allocated because for all these four modules, you don't have a choice. You have to take the module, right? Asian studies, humanities, and social sciences, and also scientific inquiry one. Scientific Inquiry 2 will not be pre-allocated because there is a basket of modules that you can choose later on. Right? Okay, so that's the first four. And out of the six uh, common core modules, three of them will be pre-allocated. GEA 1000, Data Literacy, the Design Thinking module, right, DTK 1234, and also the Writing module for FASS students, this is going to be FAS 1101. So this means that out of the 13 common curriculum modules, seven will be pre-allocated. And so here is a table right, for pre-allocation. It shows when the module will be pre-allocated. So if you look at the table here, right, so these are all the modules that we have been talking about. Right? And in addition to the seven modules in the common curriculum, the gateway module will also be pre-allocated to you. So this means that in total, eight modules will be pre-allocated to you in your first year. Right? So all the pre-allocation will happen in the first two semesters. Right? So let's look at the, the integrated modules first. Right? Remember, we have four integrated modules here that will be pre-allocated. How does that happen? This is going to happen in either of the first two semesters. So basically, we're going to spread it out. Right? In your first semester, you're going to get two integrated modules. And in your second semester, you're going to get the rest two. Right? So, and this is done on a random basis. Okay, so that's for the integrated modules. The second thing is for the DTK and GEA. So for these two modules, right, if you go back to the table here, right, we're talking about these two modules here, data literacy and design thinking. So for these two modules, you're going to get one in each semester. Right? Either you get DTK in your first semester or you get GEA in your first semester. So for the GEA 1000 module, it's actually a bit complicated, right? Because this is actually not the only module that satisfies the data literacy requirement in your common core, right, curriculum. And there are actually other modules that satisfy um, that requirement. So this means that if you actually prefer to read a more advanced module instead of GEA 1000, you can do so. 
right? Although GA1000 will be pre-allocated to you, if you decide that you don't want to read this module, you want to read a more advanced module, right, to satisfy data literacy, you can drop, right, you can request to drop the GA1000 during mod rec and then select the module that you want. Right? So you can take a look uh, at this website, which has a description of this module GA1000 and also other qualifying modules to see which one is the best for you. Okay? So this is a little special. right? This is the module that we will pre-allocate to everyone because most people will end up taking this module, but you do have a choice not to take it if you want. Okay? All right, so that's the pre-allocation for the modules in the common curriculum. And oh, the last one here, right? This one is the writing module, correct? Uh, there is a little caveat here, which is that to to take the writing module, you need to pass, you need to have the 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 English liter uh, English sufficiency, right? Proficiency. So if you need to actually read one of the English modules, you have to read the English modules before you can take the writing module. Right, so this means that if you need to read either ES1000 or ES1103, read it as early as possible because if you don't pass these modules, you cannot take the writing module. Okay, so that's just a little caveat here for this one. So lastly, I want to talk about the gateway modules. As you can see here, the gateway modules will be pre-allocated to you in semester one, right? So how does it work? So you know what gateway module is, right? It's the basically the first module that you're going to take for your major, right? And uh, so in semester one, we're going to allocate your preferred gateway module right, subject to quota constraint. This means that some in, sometimes, right, certain gateway modules are very popular, so they can be oversubscribed. But we have a limited quota for each semester. So if that happens, if the module is actually oversubscribed, you will be, some of you will be actually allocated the module in the second semester instead, right? Because we can't fit in everyone in the first semester, right? So that's for the very popular gateway modules. Now, the most important thing, how do you get your gateway module pre-allocated, right? Because everyone will be allocated a different gateway module. To get your gateway module pre-allocated, you need to declare your major, your intended primary major, during the academic plan declaration period, right, before July 14. This is the, the day after tomorrow, basically, correct? So if you want to have your gateway module of your primary major pre-allocated to you, you will need to do the APD as soon as possible, right, before this deadline. So we're going to talk about the APD in just a second. So basically, in this exercise, you're just going to tell the system, you're going to tell us what your primary major is, right? Once we know what your primary major is, we're going to proceed to allocate the, the gateway module for that major to you, okay? So this is the most important thing for the gateway module. So now, what if you miss the deadline, right? If you miss this deadline, does it mean that you don't get to read any gateway module uh, in your semester one? That's not the case. You can still select the gateway module during the mod rec exercise, right? When you can select the modules on mod rec, you can go for the gateway module that you want. Um, just, just select it on your own, right? Of course, it's also subject to quota availability, okay? Okay. So if you go back to the table, as Prof. Loy and Prof. Yap already mentioned, if you look at the table here, in your first year, you actually don't have a lot of you know, free modules to choose from, right? Because if you count the number of pre-allocation for your first semester, you're going to get two integrated modules, one of GEA or DTK, and uh, one of your gateway modules, right? So that's four, and if you're lucky, or unlucky, you're gonna also get the writing module, right? For the writing module, you're also gonna get it in either semester one or semester two. So this means that in your first semester, you probably only have either no free module to choose from or just one to choose from. It's a bit better in the second semester, you can have one or two modules, free modules to choose, right? So this means that you actually don't need to do much uh, in your first year on selecting modules in mod rec, right? Because of the pre-allocation. Okay, so that's the pre-allocation part. Now I want to talk about the academic plan declaration. 
So there are actually two things here. One is called academic plan application, and the other is called declaration. So for now, we are going to focus on declaration, right? This is what is important for you now. Um, so this is the timeline of events. As you can see here, academic plan declaration is the first thing that happens in the mod rec exercise. It actually starts today, right? So now you can already access the system to declare your major. So after the academic plan declaration, you're gonna, we're going to enter the select module phase of mod rec, which has three rounds. And after the select module phase, we're going to enter the select tutorials phase in mod rec, which has two rounds. And the last period here, the last phase here, is the add swap drop tutorial period. Right? So let's begin with the APD exercise. So what is the difference between these two, right? Let's just clarify. The academic plan declaration is for you to declare, uh, to, to declare your primary major or your second major, your specialization, your minor, so on and so forth. And this happens at the beginning, right, or before each semester. Whereas academic plan application is something else. It's for you to actually apply for those restricted program. And this happens towards the end of every semester, right? So you don't need to worry about this now, right? There's nothing for you to do at this moment. So let's just focus on the academic plan declaration. So the most important thing about APD is that everyone has to do it every semester. So it's not like you do it before your first semester and you don't need to do it uh, again, right? That's not the case. It has to be completed at the beginning of every semester, right? You need to declare whatever you can declare in the system. And why do you need to do this? Because if you don't do the academic plan declaration, you cannot select any modules on mod rec. So the submission of the APD is actually necessary for mod rec. Right? You need to do this at least one day before round one of mod rec begins. Okay? So since this is your first semester, right, when you actually go into the APD system, some of you may already see a, a major for you. And this is because that you have indicated your preference for your primary major during the registration process. Right? If you have indicated, for example, that you want to have psychology as your first major, then when you go into this system, you will probably see that psychology is already tagged as your first major. Of course, you can change it. Right? If you have changed your mind, feel free to change to any other major in the system before you submit your declaration. Right? So very importantly, once you submit your APD, you cannot change it in the same semester. Right? So make sure you choose the primary major right, that you really want, for now at least, right, before you hit submit. Okay? So here is a step-by-step -step, uh, step -step guide prepared by the Registrar's Office on how to use the academic plan declaration system. This is where you can find it. Right? It's basically on my EduRec. So this is actually very self-explanatory. I will leave it to you to, to read the guide uh, to, on how to use the system. Okay, so academic plan declaration is the first step of the mod rec exercise, right? This is number one. The second step here is for you to actually know your degree requirement. You need to know what modules you need to take to graduate. So I will leave this part to you. And the third step here is to simulate your timetable, right? Before we actually go on to mod rec. So how do you simulate your timetable? You can actually go onto this website called NUS Mods. So on this website, you can actually just choose the modules that you intend to take, right, in the coming semester, and just, you know, plug everything in to see if the timetable looks okay. So what should you look out for when you are simulating your timetable? Two things. One is that you need to make sure there is no timetable clash. This is very important. You need to make sure that for all the modules, including the tutorials or labs, right, sessions that you're choosing, no module or no tutorial overlap with each other. There shouldn't be any timetable clash. Timetable clash is not allowed. Right? So it's not going to be supported by FSS or FOS. And this also includes exam clash. Right? If you have two modules that both have final exams, make sure you check the final exam time, right? They cannot clash. Obviously, you cannot be taking two exams at the same time, correct? 
right? So for the timetable clash of modules and tutorials, we will only consider very, very special cases, right? Extenuating situations, such as if this is your final semester, you really need two core modules to graduate, and this two core module have a clashing timetable, right? If that happens, then sometimes we can consider allowing the timetable clash, right? But with proper planning, I, I think most of you will not end up in that situation. Right? So just make sure when you simulate your timetable, there is no check that there is no timetable clash. Right? Okay, so here is a question. Right? You know that for modules, you have the lecture and you have the tutorials, correct? Let's say you really want to take module A, and module A has two available tutorial slots. And you realize that both available tutorial slots of module A clash with your other modules. So what can you do? How about only registering for the lecture of module A without registering for any tutorials? That's not allowed, right? You have to register all the components of the module. If the module has a lecture and tutorial, you cannot only register for the lecture, right? It cannot be the case that you say, okay, since I cannot attend any of module A's tutorial, it clash with my other modules, let me just only register for the lecture. I will only go for the lecture without going for the tutorial, right? That's not the case. That's not how a module works. A module has a lecture component and a tutorial component. You have to participate in both, okay? So that's just a note here. All right, so that's the first thing that you need to check, right, when you simulate your timetable. The second thing you need to check is your workload. You need to make sure that your workload is in the, you know, acceptable range. So for mod rack, remember we have three rounds of mod rack, and before round three, which, is, which means that in round one and two of mod rack, the maximum workload for all the students is 23 MCs. And starting from round three, Depending on your academic performance, you are allowed to actually select modules beyond 23 MCs, right? So if you have a good academic performance, you can actually select up to 32 MCs in round three of mod rec. However, this doesn't apply to your very first semester, right? For your very first semester, because you're still trying to get used to the university life, don't be too ambitious, right? Just take the normal workload. So the maximum workload in the very first semester will just be 23 MCs, right? Okay. So there, of course, there's an exception. The exception is for the students in certain uh, special programs, right? DDP programs, for example, because they have a higher overall workload. So for students in these programs, uh, even for your very first semester, you can have a maximum of 27 MCs, okay? But for the rest of you who are in the standard single degree programs, it's 23 MCs for the first semester. Okay? There is also a minimum MC requirement, which is 18 per semester. This means that when you simulate your timetable, you need to make sure that the number of MCs that you're selecting is in between 18 and 23, okay? okay. All right. So before we actually talk about how mod rec works, right, just a few things to note. As I already mentioned, you're not going to be selecting many modules in your first year because of the pre-allocation. But even though the modules are pre-allocated to you, you still have to select the tutorials for the pre-allocated modules on mod rec by yourself. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And the second thing is that, remember, right, if you want to have your gateway module pre-allocated, declare your major on the academic plan declaration system by July the 14th, which is the day after tomorrow. And if you miss this deadline, make sure you declare your major by the 21st of July, right, so that you can actually use the mod rec system. If you don't do the APD exercise before this particular deadline, you cannot participate in mod rec, okay? All right, so now it's time to talk about the mod rec system, module registration. So this is where we are, right? We have done one, two, and three, and now it's time to uh, start mod rec. So when you log on to the mod rec system, this is gonna be how it look like. So these are all the functions on mod rec. So the first one is really just for your information, how to use mod, mod rec, right? View my classes. This is where that you can see the classes that you are enrolled in. Okay? 
select modules, the one with the shopping cart. This is the main function, right? This is where you're going to select or register for your modules. Right? So you can ignore this one, submit module request. It doesn't apply to undergraduate students. So this one, select tutorial labs, right? Self-explanatory. Add swap tutorial labs. So these two are actually for selecting and choosing tutorials. Drop classes. If you click here, you can actually drop the modules or tutorials that you are, uh, you are in enrolled in. And also the final one is to submit appeals and inquiries. So if you need to submit any appeal, right, make sure you submit the appeal on ModRec by clicking here. Okay? All right. So we're going to talk about all these functions. Let's begin with the the, the, the key function, which is select modules, right? So this is the first, this is the second thing that happened in ModRec, right? The first thing is the uh, declaration, and the second thing is for you to select modules. So how does ModRec work? Let me briefly explain the logic or algorithm of ModRec. So ModRec functions based on priority score, right? So what does it mean? This means that for every module, right? Mod rec is actually going to compute a priority score for all the students, for every single student who have selected that module in the mod rec system based on the following three components. A, the student's program requirements, B, the student's seniority, and C, the student's rank preference, right? How high the student rank that particular module. So every student who select a particular module will get a priority score, right? ModRec will compute it, and then ModRec will rank the students based on the priority score from high to low, right? And then allocate the, the available spaces of the module to the students based on that order, okay? So that's how ModRec works. So specifically, what are the three components here? Part A, the program requirement. So this is, this basically tells you how important this module is to you, right, based on what your major or second major or minor is, right? So for example, if this particular module is your major essential module, right, which means that it is a required module for your major, so this is going to rank very high, right? You're going to receive a, a really high point uh, for in this category. However, if you're only reading this module as an unrestricted elective, correct? So this means that this module is not that important to you. You don't need to read this particular module to graduate. So you're not going to receive a very high score, right, in category A. You're going to receive a lower score, right, because this module is not something that's essential to you, right? Right, so this is the, the first component, program requirement. The more important the module is to you, the more essential it is to you based on your program, the higher points you're going to get. Right? The second part is student seniority. This is very simple. Right? The graduating students are the ones who are getting the most points right? because they need to graduate, so they need the module to graduate. Right? As year one, you're actually going to get the lowest point. Right? And rank preference, what is this? When you actually select your modules on mod rec, you can rank all the modules that you have selected, right? So rank number one will be given the highest points. The rank number five or six, whatever your, your lowest rank is, the, that particular module will get the lowest point. So that's all the three components here, correct? Okay. So now we have one question, right? What if two students have the exact same priority score? That can happen, right? So let's say you and your friend, you're both in year one, right? And you have the same major, right? So when you select a particular module, the program requirement for that module for you and your friend are the same, since you have the exact same major. And you just happen to rank the module both as your number one, right? So if that's the case, obviously, as we can see here, you and your friend will actually get the same priority score for that particular module, right? So if that happens, what should we do? So in this case, we may actually rely on the tiebreakers. Right? But there is a condition here, right? We're only going to use the tiebreakers to decide who gets the module when the demand exceeds the available spaces in the module. Right? So what does this mean? Let's say the module actually has 50 available spaces, right? And you and your friend are the only two students who have selected this module, right? 
And obviously, both of you are going to get in, right? No matter what your priority score are, correct? Even if they are the same, it doesn't matter. However, let's say now this module only have one available space. And both you and your friend have selected this module, and you both of you have the same priority score. That's when the tiebreakers kick in, right? Because there is only one available space. So what are the tiebreakers? Right? So the first thing we consider is whether the student has attained the minimum workload. Right? Remember the minimum workload? How many MCs you need every semester? 18, correct? Right? So you need to remember that number. So we're going to look at whether the students have, have, have already selected at least 18 MCs. The student who has not attained the minimum workload will get the priority. Okay? So that's the number one tiebreaker. What if both students have already attained the minimum workload MCs? Then we move on to the second tiebreaker, which is to look at the module host faculty and the student's home faculty. Right? So what is your home faculty? Your home faculty is the faculty that, that houses your primary major. Right? So for example, if your primary major is history, history belongs to FASS, so FASS will be your home faculty. Right? So the second tiebreaker basically means that if you're selecting a module that is offered by your home faculty, you are going to have priority compared to some students from another faculty. Okay? So that's the second tiebreaker. The third one is the module feedback points, which is not actually relevant for you now. Right? So what is this? At the end of the semester, you're going to complete the module feedback for your modules and your lectures. And when you complete those reports, those feedback reports, you're actually going to get points. Right? So those points will be used as tiebreakers right, for the mod rec exercise. And similarly, the, the next uh, tiebreaker is the module planning exercise points, the MPE points. So what is this? It's not relevant for you now, right? You haven't done any of this. So during the semester, sometimes there will be module planning exercises, right? Which basically ask you what module you want to take next semester so we can plan, right? So if you participate in those exercises, you'll, you will also get some points. So those points will also be used as tiebreakers, right? So if none of these four things work, the last resort is luck, right? Random balloting, right? So if everything is the same, how do we decide who gets the module, right? We just depend, you, you know, we just do a random draw, okay? All right, so this is the logic of mod rec. Okay? So to see whether we understand how it works, let's look at two hypothetical scenarios. Okay? So let's say we have two students, Sam and Jen, right? They are selecting a particular module, which is a history module. So Sam is a history major, Jen is a sociology major with a second major in history. They are both in year two, and they just so happen to rank the, this history module as their second choice. Right? So the question is, who is more likely to be allocated the module? What do you think? Anyone? Sam or Jen? Sam, why? Because Sam is a first history is his first major, right? So this should be simple. This comes from the program requirement, right? Because for these two students, the seniority and the rank preferences are the same, correct? So they get the same points in category B and C, but they get different points in category A. Because Sam is a history major, so this history module to Sam is a first major requirement. And Jen is a second major in history, right? So this module to Jen is uh, to fulfill the second major requirement. So the first major modules will actually get high, higher points compared to second major modules, right? So this means that this module is basically more important to Sam than to Jen. So Sam has a higher likelihood of getting the module. Of course, this doesn't mean that only Sam will get the module, right? Of, it, it also depends on the available spaces of this module. If this module has 10 available spaces, and Sam and Jen are the only two students who are selecting this module, then both of them will get the module, right? But if this module only has one available space, then Sam is going to be the one who gets the module, okay? okay? All right, so this is the easy one. Let's look at the second hypothetical scenario. Ariel and Belle, they are selecting a psychology module. Okay? They're both in year two. Their rank preference is the same. 
Ariel is a life sciences major and second major in psychology. Belle is a social work major and second major in psychology. So both are second majoring in psychology. Who is more likely to be allocated the module? What do you think? So let me ask another question. How about the priority score for Ariel and Belle for this module? Who has a higher priority score? Ariel, Belle, same? Right, they have the same seniority, correct? They're ranking the module both as their number one choice, correct? So this means that for B and C category, these two students are actually getting the same points, right? How about category A, program requirement? Same, right? Because they're selecting a psychology module and both Ariel and Bell are second major in psychology, correct? So this module will fulfill the second major requirement for both of them. Both of them will be here in this category. So for Ariel and Bell, they will actually have the same priority score for this module. However, right, we know that when this happens, we are gonna look at the tiebreaker, right? And the tiebreaker we're using here is the student's home faculty because Ariel is a life sciences major, which is in FOS. So Ariel's home faculty is FOS. But Bell is a social work major, so Bell's home faculty is FASS. And this module is a psychology module, which is a module in FASS, right? So Bell has the, Bell's home faculty is the same as the module host faculty. So Bell will actually have a priority here in getting the module. But there is one assumption here, right? We are assuming that both students have attained the minimum workload, correct? We're assuming that both students have already selected 18 MCs at least, right? Otherwise, that will be the first tiebreaker. If either Ariel or Bell have not attained the minimum workload, then whoever has not attained the minimum workload will be the one who is more likely to get the module. Right, so we're referring to the tiebreakers here. Right? So that's just two examples to show you how mod rec uh, select the modules right, based on A, B, and C, and also the tiebreakers. Okay? okay, so let's now look at the operations of mod rec. Right? Remember, there are three rounds to select modules, right? starting from July the 21st. What's the difference between the three rounds of mod rec? The difference is that Round one of mod rec is called the protected round, right? Basically, this means that in round one, right, you can not select the modules offered by other faculties, right? Of modules that is not in your major, not in your second major, and is something from another faculty. So basically, in round one, you should be selecting the modules that actually fulfill your program requirement the modules in your major, right? The modules in your second major, in your specialization, or in your faculty requirement. You cannot just, you cannot select some unrestricted elective that is offered by some other faculty, right? If you want to take accounting module, for example, right? Which is in offered by the School of Business, you can't do it in round one, right? Of course, unless you're in some sort of a special program with the B school, right? But if you're not, you're just a single degree student in FASS, you cannot select uh, that module in round one of mod rec. You can do so in round two and three, right? For round one, what you should be doing is to select your major module, right? In round two and three, you can select all modules, right? Including the unrestricted elective modules that you want to take from other faculties. Okay, so for your very first semester, what should you do in round one? Right? As we mentioned earlier, you don't have much to do, correct? You may not have any free space, or you may just have one or two free space. So if you need to read the English modules, right? remember, if you need to read the English modules, make sure you select those modules as early as possible. Right? You need to clear that requirement as early as you can. So you can select that module in round one. Right? If you don't need to read the English module, you may actually select a gateway module. Right? Let's say you are already pre-allocated one gateway module, but you also want to explore a second major. Right? So you can choose the gateway module of your desired second major in round one. 
right? Or you can select some other module in your common core curriculum, or you, you can select another module in your, in your major, right? That doesn't require any prerequisite. So that's what you can do in round one. In round two and three, you can do basically whatever you want, okay? okay? All right, so how do we use the ModRec system? Again, there is a very detailed step-by-step -step guide prepared by the Registrar's Office, right? So you can just click on the link to see the guide, right? The system is actually quite easy to use. So let me just highlight a few functions here. When you select a module, right, basically what you will see are the following. You will see the module information, module code, and what type of activity this is. The important thing here is the vacancy and the popularity, right? So what is the vacancy? The vacancy basically show you, shows you the available spaces for this module in this particular round of mod rec. And how about popularity, right? The popularity shows you how many students have already selected this particular module at that point of time, okay? So you can look at the vacancy and compare it with the popularity to see roughly how much, how many spaces are left, how popular this module is, right? And just keep in mind that if the vacancy of the module shows up to be zero, it cannot be selected, right? Which means that this module doesn't have any vacancy in that particular round, right? So for the same module, there could be different number of vacancies in different uh, round of mod rec, okay? Okay, so these are the two main things here. Okay. And uh, so just another thing, which is the reserve list. Right? So for each module that you select, right, let's say you have already selected these two modules, you can rank them, right? which one is your first choice, which one is the second. For each module, you can actually add two backup classes. Mm -hmm. So this backup class list is what we call the reserve list. Right. So for example, you have selected this module, right? But you don't actually have to read this particular module. There are two other modules that's similar to this one. You can add these two modules as, as the backup classes for this particular module, right? Okay, so just one thing to note, the popularity number only includes the, the, the number of students who have selected the module in their main list not the number of students who have, reserve, who have selected the module in the reserve list. It doesn't show you how many students have chosen this module as their backup, right? It only shows you how many, mo how many students have chosen this module in their main list, okay? okay? So let me, due to time, let me quickly go through the tutorial registration process, right? So that's the module registration process. Okay? So for tutorial, we have two rounds, right? They are identical. And after the two rounds, we have the add, drop, and swap period. Okay? So what happens in tutorial selection? First, because tutorial registration happens after the module registration, right? So you need to make sure that your module has been already registered. You are enrolled in that module before you can select the tutorials. So this is not first come, first served, right? Basically, in each of the two rounds, you are going to decide which tutorial groups you want. You can rank up to 20, right? Number one is the, the most desirable, right? One is the highest rank, 20 is the lowest rank, right? And then we're gonna check um, the demand and the supply, right? If for that particular tutorial, demand does not exceed supply, then every student who have selected that tutorial will be allocated. If the demand exceeds supply, then we're gonna do a random balloting, right? So tutorial selection is actually very simple. So just one thing to emphasize here, right? When you're selecting, when you're ranking your tutorials, remember you can rank up to 20 tutorial slots. Make sure that you rank the tutorials across all the modules that you have registered, right? So something like this. Make sure you pick a few tutorial slots for each of the module that you have registered and rank them all together. Do not just rank the tutorials for one module only. Right? If you do this, for sure you're gonna get into some tutorial of CH1101E, but how about the rest of your modules, correct? Right? So make sure that you rank all the modules all together. Okay? okay, so you're gonna do this for two rounds. Now after round two, if you have already gotten your tutorials, then no problem, right? What if you still don't have your desired tutorial? We enter the add swap period. So in the add swap period, basically you can just add the tutorial to your list as long as there is vacancy, right? Or you can post a swap request. 
If you still cannot get the tutorial, you can actually appeal on ModRec, right? And occasionally, your tutorial group may be canceled, right? This happens if there are too few students in the tutorial, like only two or three people. So if that happens, you will be notified and alternative arrangement will be made, okay? So very importantly, as I mentioned earlier, right, you have to be registered in all the components of the module, right? So this means that if there is a module where you just cannot find a suitable tutorial group to join, you should drop the module. If you don't do it, then the faculty will actually drop it for you, right, in week five, right? So make sure when you register for your module, you can find a suitable tutorial, okay? All right. Finally, just a few other functions on ModRec, right? How do you check what classes that you're enrolled in? Just click view my classes. This is gonna show up one day after uh, each round of ModRec. So let's say round one of ModRec ends on Thursday. So on Friday, you go onto ModRec, click view my classes, you can see what modules you have gotten in round one. Okay? Now, how do you drop your modules? You can drop the module on ModRec as long as it doesn't lower your MC to below 18, right? Because you need to maintain the minimum workload, okay? As long as your minimum, as long as your number of MCs is still 18 and above, you can just drop the module on ModRec, right? If you drop a module, all the tutorials and labs will also be dropped. But the reverse is not true. If you only drop the tutorial or lab, the module is still there, right? So just keep this in mind. Okay. okay, I just want to mention these two things. Be very careful of dropping the modules during the W grade or the F grade period. So what is the W grade period? Okay. W stands for withdraw. Okay. So if you drop the module starting from 22nd of August, which is the beginning of week three, okay, Starting from 22nd of the August, if you drop the module on ModRec, you can do so, right? But dropping the module will result in a W grade in your transcript, right? meaning that it will indicate in your transcript that you have withdrawn from this module. So this module cannot be as used, right, if you drop the module during the W grade period, but your cap is not affected, okay? So this is just something to keep in mind, right? How about the F grade period? The F grade period happens from 26th of September, which is the first day of week seven, right? So this means that if you drop the module, if you want to drop the module from 26th of September onwards, you're actually gonna receive a fail F grade, right? For that particular module, you will show on your transcript. And this module cannot be as used and it's gonna affect your cap. And for this reason, you cannot drop any module during the F grade period on mod rec, right? So if something happens that you really have to drop a particular module after the F grade has taken effect, write to your home faculty for assistance, okay? So keep these two deadlines in mind. Now finally, appeals. If you want to appeal, you need to submit it through mod rec and make sure you select the correct appeal type. So these are just some examples of appeal type here, right? For example, remember GEA 1000, which we mentioned earlier, right? It's pre-allocated to you, but if you want to read a more advanced module, you can actually request to drop GEA 1000. So how do you do that? You can actually appeal under this category, right? Change a mean allocated class if you want to drop the GEA 1000, the data literacy module, right? And do not submit duplicate appeals, right? Just make sure you submit appeal uh, once. Okay? okay, for tutorials, very similar, right? If you still cannot get a tutorial after the add swap period, you can submit an appeal for tutorial uh, on ModRec. But just keep in mind that if you really do not have a tutorial slot, we may just allocate an available tutorial slot to you on a random basis, right? Of course, conditioning on that it doesn't clash with your timetable, okay? All right, so I think our time is almost up. So these are just some contact, right? So for the uh, mod rec, if you have any system related issues during the mod rec exercise, contact the registrar's office. But if you have any issues regarding modules or your particular program, contact your home faculty, either FASS or FOS, right? And that's, actually gonna be all. Thank you very much. So let's now look at the questions.
Okay, hi everyone. Um, so we are taking questions for uh, about ModReg. So if you are if you have questions, please visit um, polyev.com slash f a s s c u r r n u s f a s s u r r yeah polev p o l l e v dot com slash n u s f a s s c u r r or you can scan the QR code. We have about five minutes to take questions. Yeah, so feel free to ask them. Alright, so let me just answer a few questions here. Uh, the restricted minors, right? You cannot apply in your very first semester, right? Because for the restricted minors or majors, we need to, there are certain requirements. You need to fulfill a certain number of uh, modules and uh, we will evaluate your academic performance, right? Before offering your space. So you cannot do it in your very first semester. Okay? The slides will be uploaded. Can you still choose the mod if vacancy uh, popularity? If vacancy is less than popularity, I think, right? That's what you are probably asking. You can still choose it, yes, but you may not get it. Right? Uh, will the locations of classes tutorial be shown on mod rec? I don't, will it be shown on mod rec? No, right, no. You can look for the class locations so the class location will be on Luminous, right? Or uh, Canvas, whichever system you're using. You can check the class timetable and the location of the class on the Luminous or Canvas website. NUS mod, no. What do I indicate in the academic plan declaration if I want to do a double degree? If you are not already a double degree student, right, you will have to apply for a double degree. I'm assuming that's, that's what you're asking here, right? So if you are not a double degree student yet, you should just indicate your desired first major on the, uh, the, the, the ADP, APD. More on how reserve lists work. Okay, reserve list is just backup, right? So let's say I selected a particular economics module, right? But economics is not my first major. I just want to try one economics module as an elective. So I don't have to particular take that module, right? So, so if I don't get that particular module, I can actually add two backup classes, two backup modules for that particular module that I'm selecting, right? So for each module that you have selected in your main list, just click Add Reserve Modules, and you can choose up to two backup modules for that. Right? So that's it. When will we be informed which modules were pre-allocated for us? Uh, when mod rec begins, right, and when you log on to mod rec, you can click on view my classes. You should be able to see the pre-allocated modules there. Okay. If I change my primary major in the academic plan declaration for the second semester of year one, will I also be pre-allocated the gateway module for that major? I don't think so. No, only for the first semester. 
will RVRC modules that substitute the common core module need be mod wrecked as well as or are they pre-allocated? RVRC modules, uh, they're not pre-allocated, right? Uh, so you will have to select those modules. Uh, since some CHS modules are pre-allocated, are NUSC module that satisfy those CH? No, no. Da, da, da. I am already accepted in the double degree program. Well, what should I indicate in the academic plan declaration? Uh, if, if you can, just indicate both majors, right? I think it depends on exactly what the, the system allows you to do, right? That's it, right, for now? Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zhang Yang. Can we just uh, give her a round of applause, please? Thank you very much.